Hey, what's going on guys? It's your boy Nisho here, and we're back with uh, another update about decks that are topping, right? So last weekend, it was the first weekend of uh, the post Phantom Nightmare meta, and we saw Fire King do really, really well. We saw Fire King, Snake Eyes, or just Fire as a deck in general do really, really well. And this pie chart kind of breaks it down pretty nicely. I think this is like the most accurate description of what this format is going to be like because we just came out of possibly one of the most diverse formats in Yu-Gi-Oh history simply due to the number of decks that could be played and still see some level of success with them to a format that is now more streamlined. We know what the best deck is. We know what the strongest strategies are, but there is still going to be fringe strategies that can make it to the top simply due to the nature of the game right i think fire has definitely power crept the game but not to the same amount that it's been with like tier or Kashdira. now it's a little more even it's not as busted as other tier 0.5 formats because it's not exactly tier zero it's not going to dominate completely but it's gonna you know be pretty well represented it's definitely going to be less diverse than the format pre january ban list where it was like unchained rescue ace and pearly and labyrinth now it's like you know it's going to be fire the question is which variant of fire is it going to be so taking the data from not just this regional but also side deck remote regional fire got three of the eight slots right so i'm counting fire as snake eyes fire king or rescue ace anything that is fire in that manner fire got five of the eight slots in this event fire got about four of the eight slots in this event and this one is three out of the eight slots this one's six out of eight and this one's like a larger event than i think the last one was. well no not this one actually no the last three events have been all around the same size so six out of the eight slots what we're seeing here the pattern is that like fire is doing pretty well for itself and this one's like almost a 600 duelist and it's still taking most of the top slots we still know what's going it's going to be in the top tables but it's not going to completely dominate the game in a way where other decks cannot compete like tier limits did i don't believe this is a tier zero format yet i want to look at unchained Ubel. first off congratulations unchained players you guys get to utilize your engine in a different deck or in a new deck and second off congratulations Ubel players Ubel's finally playable <laughs> the support post phantom nightmare i heard stories before where you guys would have to play like mystic tomato and stuff to make Ubel work as a deck and i'm sorry you guys had to go through that basically the Ubel engine is kind of like makonko 2.0 Ubel can attack an opponent's monster it can't be a short battle you you don't take any damage but your opponent takes the damage instead. So basically, Makonko 2.0, except this one doesn't need Esold. They can play Shifter, they can play Super Poly, and as a matter of fact, they can Super Poly your entire front row, basically, because the fusion that they make can use any number of effect monsters on the field. So they can Super Poly your whole board, and then even though the fusion has zero attack, it can inflict 500 for each material. Just like Ubel, it can attack a monster and then not be destroyed and then your opponent takes damage and then your monsters also banish so if there is anything left on field you're still taking the damage right so the unchained side actually adds a pretty interesting uh twist to the deck not only can they go into like a uh, soul of yama into soul of rage and kind of set up like a simple setup with escape of the unchained to like pop cards but they can also go shiyama since yubel is a fiend they can preemptively pop their own yubel and then Yubel can extend into Yubel Terra Incarnate, so it gets you an extra body as you continue to put more cards on field. And the same thing with Spirit of Yubel. When Spirit of Yubel is destroyed by card effect, it, it also gets to summon the original Yubel. So, and this one summons Yubel from anywhere. It doesn't matter if it's like hand deck, graveyard, or banished. It'll summon Yubel from anywhere. So that's why Shifter is a good uh, tech in the deck because. Although not everything works with Shifter, Shifter is not going to hurt you as much as it hurts other people, I can tell you that. Tour Guide's a great starter, right? You can finish Rhino Warrior, mill one of your U-Bells, and then if you have, like, opening at Spear Gates, you can revive the U-Bell from Graveyard because it's a Fiend with zero attack, so it gives you a lot of options as to how you could play through your turn and make your board. And this is even the deck at full power. There's going to be more support post Legacy of Destruction, which comes out late April here in TCG. That's 
that's only going to make this deck stronger. So to see this deck topping now before it's even gotten its full range of support should be a deck that you keep your eyes on. Beckoning Beast is uh, cool. It, it it really is a GX deck because it's a Sacred Beast support and then Ubel support all in the same deck. It's really just because Spirit Gates is so perfect with like Ubel and Spirit of Ubel. It all goes together pretty well. Spirit of Ubel being like a pseudo hand trap that can like protect you during battle phase where it's like if your opponent's not expecting another interruption, you can summon it from hand. Can't be sure by battle, you take no battle damage. And then when it's summoned, it gets to either add or set a Ubel spell or trap card from deck which Eternal Favor is one of the uh, ones that you can set. And this one also has a super poly effect on it. You can discard a card, send it to the graveyard, and fusion using monsters on either field. So that just makes it a lot stronger. Samsara Lotus is kind of like a Lone Fire Blossom for the Ubel engine. And then it also can revive itself during end phase because the original Ubels actually have maintenance costs. I, I actually never knew that before <laughs> this support came out. Like regular Ubel needs to tribute a, a, another monster during a end phase or else it gets destroyed. And then it can't trigger if it's destroyed by its own effect. Terror Incarnate needs to destroy all other monsters on the field to stay on field, which is, you know, it, it's a mandatory effect. So it's kind of cool that S Samsara can like summon itself back. And there actually is a reason to keep this on field because if you control it and you control Ubel, you can tribute to negate a monster effect, or it doesn't negate it. The effect becomes pop a Ubel monster on field, so you can force them to pop regular Ubel or Spirit of Ubel, and then, you know, summon out either regular Ubel or Terror Incarnate. If they do that to the fusion, the fusion can't be destroyed by card effects, so it basically whiffs the effect. And Nightmare Pain is pretty cool because it lets you pop a dark monster in hand or field to add a Ubel card or a card that mentions Ubel from deck to hand. Unchained Soul works perfect with that so like in case you want to pop a beckoning beast or like in case you already have access to your u-bells you could then go into unchained soul or uh, trigger the, the unchained soul and then summon it and then uh, pop a card your opponent controls non-targeting so it's a cool deck concept that we got here and i'm interested to see how much more it can do and gustav's here because u-bells are level 10 like the spirit of u-bell and regular u-bell are both level 10 so they can make rank 10s. You could play the bigger train, like the, the, the Juggernaut Lieb, if you wanted to, but I don't believe uh, this person had space. I also find it pretty interesting that, like, there's no SP in this extra deck. I don't know if it's because of budget, right? Because Soul of Rage can make an SP Little Knight, and the fact that, like, Samsara is level 1, and Beckoning Beast, zero attack, you could make Amirage, or, like, an Anima, or Link Rebo with some of this support and like very easily link climb into a SP Little Knight and it just it just isn't here. The fact that you're able to get like top eight in this new format with a deck that's really that really has a lot of surprise factor and a lot of interesting quirks to it before it's gotten its second wave of support. Good stuff. Me and my friends have gone back and forth about this, right? There's a third form of Ubel called the Ultimate Nightmare. And that one is one that I personally think is a win more card. It's not necessary to play in the list because the, the guy in the deck profile, right? The deck profile is down here. The, the guy who does the deck profile, he says that he wished that he had it in certain games. But I'm like, bro, you got to seven place in the regionals, right? Like how much more could have Ultimate Nightmare really gotten you compared to where you are now? with a U-Bell deck. Like, this is either a one loss or one draw out of the whole event. I don't think the Ultimate Nightmare is necessary. Both Terra Incarnate, U-Bell, and Spirit of U-Bell all float. These two is when they're popped. It's Terra Incarnate is when it leaves the field. They get to float into the bigger one, right? And then uh, Ultimate Nightmare doesn't do anything, right? Ultimate Nightmare doesn't float. The only difference between Ultimate Nightmare and these U-Bells is that U-Bells need to get attacked to inflict the damage. So both U-Bell and Terra Incarnate need to get attacked to inflict the damage, whereas Ultimate Nightmare can attack into your opponent's board and then inflict damage. But, you know, the fusion does that anyway, so it feels a little more win more. And then Nightmare Pain, when you inflict damage with a U-Bell effect, your opponent takes like double the damage, basically, because this inflicts the damage and Nightmare Pain also inflicts the damage, so you basically take double what you would take normally. If you can attack into like a 3k body and you can use at least four monsters your opponent controls to summon this defending lover forever or to make two of them using at least two monsters, it's like you kind of have like a way to go into game without even needing to swing over the opponent's monsters. You can just leave their the monsters that they've already used on field. And then you also have Gustav, which the fusion is not level 10, it's level 12. But if you can inflict like a decent amount with Defender Forever, Gustav, and Nightmare Pain, you can definitely steal wins 
Resolving Shifter against the right deck. Uh, turn one is tantamount to winning right there. Nib against Rogue is pretty strong. <laughs> Nib, Nib uh, into a lot of matchups are, is pretty strong. I don't think it's perfect. I don't think you need to main Nib. I think Nib can be sighted. It's definitely not bad to have around either. So now we're seeing a Punk Virtual World deck also make it to not just top eight, but the top four. We look into the main deck, we look into the side deck. First off, we're not seeing any Beatrice uh, Ghost Meets Girl combo, which is like, okay. You know, cause you would think that would be the way that they could steal some games going first, but they're not. They have Silent Graveyard inside to play around Fire King and uh, Graveyard decks and strategies. Even like Tier Elements can probably lose to this. Cross out's pretty, pretty strong, right? This format, especially if you're playing all like the good hand traps, right? So that's why they have some weird hand trap ratios, like one nib, two droll, two ash, uh, two imperm. Because when you're on cross out timing, you gotta stuff as many as possible. It's not, it's much less about the quality of the hand traps and rather just the number of possibilities that you can negate. Uh, Ghost Ogre is actually not that bad. This format, it can stop King Sark. It can stop uh, a few other things. I think some of the voices of voice cards as well. So Ghost Ogre isn't bad. And then Gravity Collapse being like the secret tech where you tribute a Synchro to stop your opponent's summon and then their turn is just over. So the fact that they have both Calamity to end a turn and Gravity Collapse to end a turn in case they, they can't go into Calamity is pretty crazy. The fact that they go Synchro Rumble, when they go into Crimson Dragon, they have a card that's searchable off of it. And this is a really decent extender. It can summon back either Tuners or level seven or eight Dragons, uh, Lulu or um, their Punk Engine. And then we have Boost Warrior here as well. Uh, probably because we have a, level, a lot of level three tuners, they maybe want to make something like a Cupid Pitch. And then Cupid Pitch helps dig them into the Punk Engine. Cause I know Xiamen has 600 defense. Does Lulu have 600? Oh, she, she does have 600 defense. Okay. So that makes a lot more sense, right? Cause if you open e Telly plus a Xiamen, you go Boost Warrior into the Xiamen. And then um, you get to make Cupid Pitch, Cupid Pitch. Uh, like, let's say you use the Amon to search, right? So you search Foxy Tune, Foxy Tune drop, summon Deer Note. Um, and then Cupid Pitch can lower itself down to level one because you use a level three tuner. And then one plus five equals six. You summon either Gaia Armor or your Coral Dragon or a Charge Warrior. I guess it doesn't really matter which one. And you get to search the Lulu because you used Cupid Pitch for a Synchro. What's funny is that they're not playing the level 6 Virtual World Synchro. I thought that <laughs> that actually seems like a pretty strong play for what they could do here. They could also just uh, go into Dragon Drive. So yeah, it, it's just a really interesting list. And Psy Impulse. I don't know what this card is doing here because we don't have Maxi in the format. I guess maybe for going first, this could be a pretty interesting card because you can force them to shuffle back a five card hand and draw three so they start with only four cards instead of six. And that could be a really significant setback, especially if you can still make a Calamity or even end on Shen Shen plus like a Crystal Wing. That's still a pretty significant setback. Even like a Shuriking on that end board could be pretty damaging. With only four cards in hand, like two or three negates might be enough to just get you the game. So it's a really interesting tactic and it's a really interesting virtual world deck we've seen virtual world top a little bit last year especially near the more open side of october where like i felt like a lot of decks had the chance to play people were playing a lot more diverse decks uh people were just burnt out of playing meta and people were just playing the decks that they enjoyed and that was a really fun time in Yu-Gi-Oh! and it's really good to see that Yu-Gi-Oh! has not gotten to the point where you can't play stuff like this the game is still balanced enough to where Stuff like this can still do pretty well for itself. It's just a good thing to see. This has been your boy Nistro here. Um, let me know what you guys think about these two decks in the comment section below. And I'll see you guys in the next one.